Bonsoir. Good evening. Buenas noches. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Um, on behalf of Cinematech, Courtisan, and uh, the Embassy of Mexico and Brussels, I uh, wish you a warm welcome at, this, uh, at tonight's event. And th this event is actually part of a retrospective. A retrospective dedicated to a filmmaker who has, over the years, established himself as, one could say, one of the key figures, one of the central figures, in which, um, in what is often considered as some kind of new wave of Mexican cinema. And over the past decade, we have been really impressed, and I think a lot of people worldwide have been impressed as well, by his cinematic explorations into the mundane, into the everyday. Explorations which are both remappings, you could say, of the domains of fiction and documentary, and explorations that give us some insight in the, in the social reality of, of, of Mexico. So that's why we are very happy, very happy to have this filmmaker here to open the retrospective and at the same time present one of his key films. Um, so please give a, a warm welcome to Nicolas Pereira. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for inviting me here uh, and you guys for coming. It's uh, quite nice to be here uh, showing this film again. Uh, I won't say much, but we'll have time afterwards to talk more about the film once you've seen it. Perhaps I'll, I'll just mention that this film, I, I made it in 2010. Uh, at the time I was living in this uh, town about an hour away from Mexico City in the south. Uh, it's a place that I had visited all my life, and it was uh, a place that was uh, very important for me growing up. And at the same time, it's a very problematic place to me because I was visiting there as a... My parents have a cottage there, and so we would go to this town uh, as kind of like the rich family that lives in Mexico City but has a, um, a vacation home there. And then there is this whole society that lives there year-round serving people like me and my family. And so... Uh, it was a very important film for me to make because it was talking about a, a, a space that was very close to me but that I kind of didn't belong completely. So I won't say m much more but I'm sure afterwards we'll talk a little bit more about that. And thanks again for inviting me and thank you for coming. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this, this is your fifth film, your fourth or your fifth film. It was made only three years or four years after your debut film, which was uh, just a graduation film. And I think it's important to note that there are quite a, a few resonances between um, all of these films that you, that you made in this period, between this film and the films that you made before, and some of the films you made afterwards. So it's a, you could say it's a bit of a constellation, a constellation which, which has a lot of references in common. So I was, I was wondering, what does it mean for you? What significant, significance does it have um, to have your film shown in this context, in the framework of, of, a, of a retrospective? Uh, I mean, it's actually quite nice, and it's, it's, for me, important in some ways. And most of you, perhaps even all of you, haven't seen anything that I've ever done except this. But in almost all my films, Gavino, the actor in this film, he appears in almost every film I've ever done. And Teresa, the mother, also appears in a lot of the films. And they always appear as mother and son. And he's always Gavino, and Teresa's always a mother called Teresa. And uh, in, in a series of other films, there's also a, a girlfriend of Gavino's, Luisa, who appears in many films, and a friend of Gavino's, Paco, who also appears in many. Who, they don't appear in this film, but they appear in many films. and. Gavino is a theater director who also has a theater company, and the theater company is, is, is himself and these other two people who are not in this film but appear in a lot of my work. And one of the things that interests me is the, is the idea of how we represent ourselves. How does 
the Mex as a Mexican director that making films about Mexico, what is the process of representation of a country or of a space? And because I keep the same actors in the same relation, same dynamics, same relationship dynamics, but sometimes they're in a rural area like here, and sometimes they're in the city, sometimes they're poor, sometimes they're wealthy, uh, but the relationships stay the same, uh, there is a level of abstraction because if you see a lot of the films, you recognize them and you know that there's a fictional element to it. And so, uh, in many ways, the films work better all together because then the idea of representation becomes uh, quite important. I don't know if I make myself more or less clear. Uh, I, I have a problem with uh, the the idea of saying this is Mexico, let's say, that's it's 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 uh, because I don't have the authority to do that, but also because I don't think that it's even possible to do to you know to make a film that represents uh, an actual space and actual people. So by using the same actors in all the films, there is a level of distanciation that you realize that there's a point of view because of this. And obviously, in the film, in this film, I also do many other things in order to do that, but. Uh, Showing them together shows not only a formal progression of every single idea that I've had because they kind of sort of pile up, but also you see that the I mean, it's sometimes it's nice watching them chronologically because you see Gavino with a lot of hair and then ten years later with like no hair and things like that as well, uh, you know. But because you can remember the relationship of Gavino and his mom of one film and then you see them again in a later film and it's different, but there's echoes of them. You mentioned uh, your actors, uh, Gabino, Teresa, and this, this other people as well. And what is their what is their role in this questioning of representation? How does this collaboration work between you and them? Is is is, is there a sense of community that you find important for the construction of your films? I mean, I'm not sure. It's strange because when I met Gabino and his theater company, I was a bit jealous of the way they worked because they would start a project all together. Uh, they discuss the project, they direct it all together, they mount it, they act in them. So it's a lifelong process of making work as a community. Whereas the life of a film director tends to be a bit more lonely, where you work alone for a very, very long time, not only writing the screenplay, but also finding spaces and finding money and all of that. And then when you're ready to shoot, then you get together with a, with a bunch of people, and then very fast that goes away. So for me, at least it's nice that when I, for the longest time I was only making films with them, so it was nice to go to at least have a continuity in in the process. And also, Gabino became some kind of, not exactly a co-director, but perhaps someone that uh, we would talk about ideas. So he's not only acting in the films, but he's providing a lot of the ideas for the films. And uh, yeah, so he became like a key collaborator, which is super nice to have in any work, I assume. And uh, as you mentioned, this question of representation is really at the heart of, of your work, I think, of all your work. Um, and you go against or you try to confront all the rules and the codes of, uh, of the tragic drama, uh, this idea of consistency, recognizability, uh, believability, credibility, and so forth. Um, I was wondering, and there's a lot of fragmentation in your work as well, I was wondering how much of that is calculated in advance and how much uh, of it is is, um, is done in the process of making the film and editing the film. I mean, I would say that almost anything I say and I will say right now has to do with things that I've thought after making the film. And making the film has a lot more to do with intuition and and... I mean, there's a screenplay, there's some ideas, you you know, I, I try to go somewhere, but also in particular this film, the screenplay looks very different than the film itself because things were not working, so we're finding new things. And I also didn't know, because it's also a fragmented work, I didn't know where each scene was gonna end up in the actual film. And uh, the ideas of, for example, the first shot of the film with the, the first series of interviews with the kids, I remember that we started about you know two in the afternoon with it was sunny outside and we were shooting these uh, these interviews and they were very free interviews so I was asking them questions um, 
and it was all very boring and they took forever to formulate answers so by the time it was night time and they were tired we I just wrote something down and I say you say this and then the, when the camera pans and goes exactly here then you respond <coughs> this, and then you, we, we choreographed and rehearsed it and so for example those and I didn't know at the time what it meant I just wanted the scene to work and so I wrote it all down but of course later I watch it and I like this idea that that you can manipulate uh, something that feels raw but it's incredibly calculated at the same time and it worked really well for the ideas of the film in relation to the representation of certain people. Um, there is something very striking in the form of the interview as well. I mean, it sets, uh, in a way it sets the tone for the film. Yeah? It gives the film some kind of credibility so the shock is even bigger <coughs> when you're confronted with this deconstruction of, of, the, of the credibility. I mean, I, for me it was very important to have something that, I mean, I don't know how, because I, it's hard for me to put myself in the position of an audience member that doesn't know what's going on, obviously because I know what's going on, but, uh, and I don't know how it was for you, but when I, the idea for me is at the beginning of the film, you perhaps question the veracity of the interviews, but because the kids are pretty good at what they do, then you're kind of immersed and you're like, oh, this is very heavy and how can the brother think the other brother killed his girlfriend and it's very heavy. But then very soon after that, when it's very clear that professional actors are involved and they're, they don't speak like them and they don't look like them exactly, and then the films, the, and then the scenes become fragmented, then I'm hoping that you start questioning the interviews and then you start thinking perhaps the interviews are part of the fictional construction uh, but for me the main point is to create a level of sentiment towards a space and so I use some tools from documentary but more the 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 practical tools the idea of the interview the idea of putting the camera in a certain position and a voice from behind the camera and the power dynamics that that means you know the director that tells the people in front what to do or ask very poignant questions I want people to to ask questions about who is this guy asking this horrible question to these poor children and then maybe this guy is one person that is part of the society. Uh, anyway, my intention is that it's not very clear what this space is and what how the space looks like but I'm hoping that you know you have uh, you can construct different ideas in your mind about the space and the people. Well, talking about space, this is the first film you made in a, in a rural environment, in a rural space. Did that change the parameters for you, the, the working parameters? Yeah, perhaps, I don't know, but perhaps... Uh, it's also the first one that is more about community than about a limited amount of, of characters. And the main thing that changes more that I'm working with a lot of non-professional characters all the time Whereas in the other films I was mostly working with professional people, so it goes a lot faster, and uh, you know, and we are all in the same page to a certain degree. And whereas he, and also I was following a screenplay. In the other films, more or less, the screenplay is followed as I wrote it. Whereas here, because things were not working as I wish they worked with the non-professional actors, then I had to kind of go in different spaces. So I think it has to do less about being in a rural setting versus a city than a lot more to do with working. Uh, also, I was at a time where I was kind of getting really inspired with whatever formal quirkiness we could come up with and anything that seemed uh, uh, interesting, mainly for reasons of representations, would like become for example, one thing that happened that was very funny was that Gavino, the, the actor in my films, he also acts in a lot of other Mexican films, and he was the main actor in a film shot in the same town a year before, but the film that he had made the year before was like a big, per my films are were like three of us going around with a camera and a microphone so nobody pays attention to us, but Gavino had made a film in that same town that was like a $2 million film with uh, you know, big trucks coming in, and, and he was a main actor, so he was a bit of a celebrity in the town already. Like, people recognized who he was and would yell at him. And he's also in some TV shows, so people n knew who he was. And so, while we were shooting the film, I thought, like, well, maybe I should watch this film that he had done at the time, because, you know, it's in the same space and the same actor. Uh, and I saw it, and I was like, oh, God, this is terrible. And... Uh, uh, 
and I'm doing kind of this, and the reason I thought it was kind of terrible was beyond the film itself, is this idea that <coughs> it was a kind of film where uh, there's a, a, an, an idea of representing Mexico, but uh, with, you know, rural area, but with professional actors from the city, and cleaning up everything, and pretending that Mexico is these people that can act in a very particular way and that the school looks in a very particular way and it was kind of like the most like a very plastic object derived from the from the actual town something like if you invite your in-laws to your house but before they come you paint the house and you kind of like clean everything and you make the beds and and then they come in and they think you live like that like that but a lot and so I was uh, I was thinking maybe I'm doing something similar because I'm bringing the same actor to the same place and so I started getting concerned. So one of the things we did because I was in this mode of like, oh, you know, cinema is anything and you can, you know, come up with ideas and so on, is that one of the scenes in that film, I, I transcribed it and I shot it but with an extra of the film and Gavino, so the scene where they're sitting in the, in the bed and he says, can't you tell that we're dancing and, and he has something, it's very kind of a strange scene, and then I repeat that film, like that scene again in the dance. So that f scene exists in a, in a different film that Gavino is also in, in, in the same town, but a different director. And for me, it was important to sort of talk about, uh, you know, how, what are the processes that we're taking into, like what, what are the mechanics in which we're representing ourselves, or we're representing areas of Mexico. So I wanted to comment on that, and it's a small kind of inside joke because nobody knows that that scene, you know, whatever. But during the, <laughs> but while watching it, I'm hoping that you see that moment and you realize there's something very strange happening because it kind of seems like they're rehearsing a scene. And then when the scene plays out, it doesn't look like any other scene in the film. It's more like a soap opera type acting space. Uh, so it was important that you could watch the film and think all the time that what you're looking at is not the space but a very concrete point of view of someone who's an outsider. Well, this is indeed a very striking scene, the, the one with the party scene which is preceded, which what turns out to be a rehearsal of the party scene. And you have talked about, about your work, about your cinema, in terms of games, yeah, the games of, of cinema. Uh, games of permutations, uh, variations, and, and so forth. And it makes me think of uh, Bertolt Brecht, who, what he did in, in, in theatre, and he also worked with rehearsals and, and variations and, and so forth. But I think the effect of, of your games, to call it, give it that word, is, is very different. Uh, it was, it's not about demystification. In my view, it, it's more about um, deepening a sense of mystery almost. W would, you, would you agree? Yeah, sometimes because you are not exactly pulled away from the film, but at, at least I hope that perhaps you're just kind of trying to figure out the mechanics of it, sort of like the, the, the type of construction. And then there is also different types of these games, like, uh, for example, there's the repetition of the letter, who I'm hoping like the audience starts memorizing the letter themselves, and they're like, why well, am I, I know what he's going to say, and that process to me is interesting in and of itself of listening to to words being repeated and then suddenly you know as well. But then you're seeing these two actors who are professional actors going through the letter and then it cuts and then the letter continues but now it's a non-professional actor and then Gavino is no longer the fictional character but is the actor trying to explain the letter to a non-professional actress who's struggling through it while the text stays the same the shot is very similar, but very different things are happening on the screen. So I'm interested in that you don't know what that, if it's a distanciation method, like in Brecht, let's say, but you don't understand it. You don't know what is what is going on. So you have to also kind of uh, uh, decode to a certain degree why it's happening. I don't know if it makes sense. I couldn't have not help noticing that uh, um, this process of memorizing, this process of transmission of, of knowledge, is something that comes back in, in several of your films. I think in the installation of the film you made before, just after, there was also it was also very very present. 
What is it that, that interests you in this idea of transmission, of learning? <coughs> Watching that, yeah. that process. To tell you the truth, it's the, mainly the musicality of it that interests me. Like it's a, it has a lot more to do with like, I, I like choreography a lot, and it's different, you know, because it's a voice thing, but I like the, the sound of it, and the, it's less intellectual and a lot more physical. And I love seeing people repeat things to each other, and, and I think there's a beauty in that uh, communal uh, process, and actors do it all the time, and, but people do it for other things. I also like that you're rehearsing in general, and that has to do more with life, you know, like, happens to me sometimes and I'm, like, lying in bed at night and I forgot to write an email, so I start writing it in my mind and, you know, I start, and then I write it two, three times, four times, and then, so the, and then obviously in the morning you don't remember, but that whole process of spending a lot of time rehearsing things that then eventually there is no moment, there is not, you're never on the stage and actually get to do it, but it's the, it, the rehearsal for the rehearsal in itself and I mean I don't know about other people but I engage in that process a lot in life in general maybe I, I have some level of anxiety sometimes so uh, when you're anxious about anything like if you're in a foreign country let's say and you're gonna go and ask for a beer and so you know how to say the word beer, but then you think about it three times before, and then you're, uh, you're asking yourself, I'm gonna do, this, do it like this, like that. And so if that process is shared, it's beautiful, I think. So if you have someone else that you can, you know. So it's really about sharing for you, didn't it? Sharing, yeah. Yeah, and, but a lot uh, is the physical aspect of it, like the musicality of it, the choreography of it. Or to, to come back to this dynamics between truth and untruth, I think it's uh, this it's something very contemporary, it's something that you, 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 I see in a lot of uh, cinema nowadays, also a lot of literature. It's all almost if you, it's all almost as if these games, as as you call them, are used to bring belief into play again, as it, as it, as if to to act against um, a sort of culture of distrust, a culture of uh, of cynicism, as if these games. Bring up the que the question of belief again. What does it mean to believe? What does it mean in b to believe in representation as well? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's very important because I think the process of generating fictions is a process of constructing history, in many ways. And so, it's not about finding is it false, is it true, is it? It's more about engaging the mind into the fictional realm, and. Uh, but in a fictional realm that you're questioning all the time because these are the things that are later uh, the basis of history. I mean, that's how we have constructed history always through documentation of things, through representation of things, through, you know, through people's conversation, whatever is recorded. And, uh, and I want people to see fictions take them seriously and it helps uh, if there is a level of engagement where you're not sure where you're standing and so you're questioning everything you're watching and so what you you conclude after watching something has a has more depth perhaps or a more even more authority maybe this there's not a very important element in your let's say resistance against against the codes of tragic drama this is your that's your focus on the mundane and the trivial the uh, everyday, it's, it's the, this form of the, the chronicle, which is traditionally opposed to the form of, of, of fiction. But I feel, as, as, for me, there's a, there is this very important, um, almost a balance between immobility and, and this idea of flux, as if the film almost at any point can collapse into something untamed. Uh, some, some kind of uncharted uh, territory that it's not only about observing the immobility of, of, of life, the hopelessness, etc. Because there's, I have like two big interests in that sense. I'm, I'm very, very interesting in the everyday, mainly because uh, 
my life and most of the people around me, they don't have such amazing turning points and climaxes and complications. But, you know, we do things in very, you know, I don't know, you get a job and you get up and you go to work and you have very small conversations and so on. And if I dismiss all of that as not being interesting, then my whole life is not interesting, you know, and there's no reason, and my friends' lives are not interesting and so on. So I want to find meaning in my life as I live it, so I have to pay attention in the everyday because, you know, that my life and the ones around me are not full of extreme dramas and so on. So it's a very sort of practical reason of why I'm interested in that and looking when I, you know, visit my grandmother or, or whatever and I look at how she makes tea and things and I'm interested in her hands and her gestures and her movements and and the same with my son or whatever, you know, so I'm interested in that on the one side, but then also I'm very, I'm very kind of concerned about the mechanics of producing images and sounds for cinema and the manipulation that that entails and so I'm interested in all the possibilities of manipulation and so that those things together are they're almost contradictory because one is very passive and and calm and and you just observe and the other side is how do you play with that which is almost uh, you know, there's no story to hold on to, but there is all kinds of weird things happening anyway. But there are more formal mm -hmm. things. There's something else that's very particular to this film in the context of your work, and this is, uh, for me, the presence of violence. Yeah, but it's not the violence that we know from the Hollywood imaginary from, of, of Mexico and the violence of sicarios and uh, corruption and so forth. It's a violence that is very subdued. There is always present under the, under the surface. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Because this is the only film, I think, in, the, in your oeuvre, where this violence is really uh, palpable. It was mainly because I was making the film about a place, and a very concrete place, and so what happened is that in this town, uh, when I was, I was living there in 2009, 2010, by around the time I, was sh I shot this film, and you could sense that things were changing in the town. Uh, I mean, it was always a very conflicting thing for me that there was these houses of rich people that came on the weekends only, and then the, all the servants of those rich people that live on the side of the town in very small shacks, and they could always see swimming, empty swimming pools and empty tennis courts, and then people coming in maybe once or twice a month only. And so that obviously generates attention and a level of violence, not only between the people that have the homes and the people that live in the towns, but also between the people in the town themselves, because obviously everybody wants to work for the richest people in that in that town because they would make more money. But then, so people start lying about, uh, you know, you shouldn't hire that person because that person uh, steals of you, and then they fight back in the town, and you know, so all kinds of problems. When you set up a society like that, obviously all kinds of issues and problems are gonna ensue. Uh, and I kind of lived through that uh, quite a bit uh, growing up. And I, you know, I used to play a lot with, with a lot of the children in, the, in that town because I spent a lot of time there. Uh, and you could sense this level of violence. But then also around that time it was when uh, the Mexican government launched uh, an attack on uh, like a war on drugs kind of thing. And so what ended up happening is that Cuernavaca, which is a, uh, a city close by, became quite violent all of a sudden and uh, became uh, full of um, um, unrest. And because it's a close by town, there was some drug dealers that were suddenly starting to operate in this town where we were living, which meant uh, that while I was living there, there were days that I don't remember if it was official, but we all knew that after <laughs> nine o'clock or ten o'clock, as soon as the as soon as it was dark, you were not supposed to get out, which was super bizarre for me because it was the first time in my life that I had lived a situation like that where nobody would leave their house at, at, at a certain moment. So I made this film with these actors playing military guys, and very soon after we shot the film, they started being actual military stops in 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 the town. So you, I could already sense while we were shooting this sort of like the escalation of violence and and you know actual you know drug dealer violence in the town and, 
so it was something that was also obviously very important to me. That's and uh, and then interfamily violence is something that you don't see in the film, but is very present. And I used I worked for a while uh, making sort of activist videos for uh, for rural areas about alcoholism and drug addiction and interfamily violence, things like that. And so I, I was thinking about those things as well when I was make, making the film. So uh, even though you never see, you know, some drunk man hitting a woman or something like that. For me, it's embedded in the film, uh, you know, the way that most men are, men like most, uh, they, there's a lot of talk about absent fathers in the film, and there is, uh, and the other, only man that appears starts telling the story about how he left his wife and went to the United States and, and told her a crazy story and all of that. So, yeah, anyway, so all of these things amount to me to, to talk about the violence in a place. So this this explains why this absent father is a figure that comes back in almost all your films, I think. So in one film, I mean, the absent father is present or absent yeah. in all of the films, except <laughs> in one film where he actually comes back. Yeah. It's the film that came after this one, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Do you want Do you want to intervene or ask questions or respond to what has been said? Some kind of positive. A message to give the things to be overcome. Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm sure you can. Perhaps the problem is that uh, filmmakers are generally uh, people from the bourgeoisie in general, like, or I don't know how to say that, uh, like, uh, and they're people who are rich people who are rich in relation to the country who have chosen to 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 engage in art because they find problems of the space they live in perhaps I mean, I'm not sure I'm just speculating and uh, yeah I think audiences have to be very aware of the fact that they're they're being shown stories by by rich kids you know, in general. <laughs> I mean there is something of that uh, as opposed to, and so, w when you grow up in a certain society where you have a certain education and then you decide to become an artist or filmmaker or whatever, you automatic the automatic thing is that you become critical of the space that you come from because you realize that you, have, you are uh, taking all the benefits of a society who that is not functioning well, but you can be on top. I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, I don't exactly think it's a, it's a guilt thing. I think it has to, more to do with you understand your position of power and perhaps you feel certain responsibility. But that's, um, it's very personal. I'm sure if there was like three other Mexican filmmakers here, we would fight about it and they would say something different. But I have a sense that I feel, for example, that I have two different important responsibilities. One is a responsibility with the society I grew up with and that I want to talk things through and think things through, which generally has a lot more to do with things that I don't think are working properly than celebrating those things that I think are great, which I also do, I think, sometimes. But, uh, but that's one big responsibility. And for me, the other big responsibility is kind of like my other home or my other... Uh, homeland, which is cinema, and so I have, for me, a responsibility with cinema of uh, re-question what it is that we've been doing and not just reproduce what I've seen in the past. Uh, yeah. And like this, <coughs> death is something that they have to learn to deal with it somehow. I don't know if, if this is something that you experienced while you were living there. You know, it's very strange because I, I think I understand what you're saying is that there's a banality of the way that the presentation of the death is presented and there is, and then there's a super drama with something that's perhaps more common and is normal that people separate and whatever. It was very weird and it's the only scene that I still don't know if I should be in the film or not and I, it's somewhat problematic. The scene where I asked the woman about her husband who died 
and she says it kind of easily, but there is a there is a level of in her face there's an uneasiness, but not you know, but but she kind of just says you know my husband was killed and so on, but the only level of uneasiness that she has is not because she's telling me that story, but I don't know if you remember the shot at the beginning. She's sitting with her four children like on the, on the bed. So when I went to shoot that scene, I had met her a couple months before and I knew the story so I had gone to her house the day before and I asked her if we could do an interview about it and she said uh, that yeah, that it would be fine. So we showed up, I asked her to sit with her kids because they, she claimed like they would be fine hearing the story, it didn't matter anymore because they had like gone through it a lot. We put the camera, we put a light, I asked her the question, she started talking and the kids became a bit bored and impatient so they, start, they, they got up and they started running and then she starts getting really worried so she's telling me the story about the, her husband who was killed but she's worried that the kids are not sitting like I told them they should be sitting because it's a film and it's... and then I realized the position of power I was in, right? because she cares more about disappointing me for the shot because the kids were supposed to be sitting, then what she's telling me, which is a, the tragedy of her life in a way, or at least the most recent one. And in that sense, to me, that kind of summarizes what you were kind of saying, that there is a, a level of internalizing death and, and just assuming that that's just a possibility and it happened to so many people that they know and so on in, many, in so many different <coughs> circumstances that I'm sure it's it's still incredibly dramatic, but again, this film is a film about my point of view, not a, bit, not a film about the, the actual reality of the space, and that's why I do all these games, uh, you know, to show that it's my point of view. And from my point of view, when I, you know, spend time with these people, it seems that there is so much talk about people being almost disposable, and so in a way it was more dramatic for someone to split up with their husband or, or someone cheating on someone else or whatever than death it seemed. And so I was not conscious of it while I was making the film because I was I just wanted to talk about violence in general and and so on. But you know, when I edited it I noticed, you know, it's strange how uh, easy it is for them to talk about all these things and yet a separation and also there is a story become central to the film, whereas the different deaths are kind of just surrounding, they're like atmospheric almost. I mean, I don't know if people here know Pedro Costa, but he's like one of the best filmmakers alive today, so it's a very difficult thing to answer, you know, because obviously I admire his work a lot and I think uh, what he does is incredible. And I'm sure, despite the fact that films are one thing and where people talk about the films are a different thing, for one, I think. And also that's why I say that a lot of the things I say about my films have a lot to do with me trying to reflect on what I'm making after I make it. And I've heard him speak and I think we disagree on almost anything related to cinema, yet uh, I think that his process and his ideas are incredible. Like the way he comes up with with films, and the and at the end of the day, a lot of the things that I've done in the past, perhaps not so much in this film, but in some of my work, is not so different in terms of the process. Like of uh, I, for example, in this film, I know the characters really well. I've spent many a lot of, a lot of time with them. We rehearse a lot of things, and you know, there's a lot of performativity and. There are some similar process, I think, of, from what I understand of how he makes his, his work. But I'm really interested in experimental film, I'm interested in artifice, I'm interested in, uh, in, let's just to be quick, like in contemporary art, let's say, and as I understand, uh, he despises all of that. So, uh, you know, for him, the materiality of film is a little bit more, uh, he's more modernist, I guess, I don't know how to say it, but um, I'm sorry, it's a terrible answer, but it's a complicated one, too, question. Do you think that you shared the same 
point of view uh, politically? I don't, can you, because I don't know what, what the, uh, is it? You, you admitted before uh, one kind of uh, bourgeois point of view, and I think that Pedro, of course, is so uh, Yeah, but they ask him where he comes from, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's not a kid from the favelas where he's making the films. He's not Ventura making a film about Pedro Costa. You know, it's the old, you, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and this an expensive art, I mean artists in general, but also cinema is so expensive and it's, and, and it's embedded in all these other processes that it's, of course there's exceptions, but Pedro Costa is not one of them, but there, I'm sure there is uh, cinema that comes from other places, but I mean I remember one time we were at the Rotterdam Film Festival and, and Pedro Costa was there as well, but we took a picture of the Mexican filmmakers and I was the most brown one of them all. And so I was like, this is kind of strange, you know, and all their last names were like French and like, you know, so uh, it tells a lot about who's making these films and who's providing rep their representation for other people. So I spent a lot of time with like the children and the, all the non-professional actors, not because I wanted to make a film, but because I was living in the town and somehow, like, I have children as well, so my children were playing with those kids, and uh, and the man that is in the van is, like, a very funny man who's always drinking outside of our store, so when I go to drink beers outside of this convenience store, we hang out and we talk. And also, I, because I don't make films where I write something and then I look for people, I write films that, I, when I write them, I already know who's going to, play. So all the people that appear in the film are people that I knew way before I had the idea to make the film. So I know them. I mean, we're not best friends with all of them or whatever, but I do have a sense of who they are. And also because I'm too shy to come up with someone that I don't know and ask them to be in my film and to do things. So I, I ask people that I know. And also that's why my friends are in the film. So even, for example, there's an actor who's the other military guy, not Gavino, but the other one. So I'd never seen him act, he's a professional actor, but he was a friend that I had met a, a couple of times. So I called him and I said if he wanted to come. But I, it's kind of a constellation where I'm at the center in that sense, where I know all, everybody, but they don't know each other. And I mean, Teresa was actually only three days in the town when we shot this film. She just came in, she was three days and then she left. Uh, so. She, had, she doesn't know anybody besides Gavino or anybody else. and uh, So there is not a sense of community among these people on the screen at all. It just happens to be that I know all of them, but they don't know each other. Some of the people in the town do know each other because they live there, but not because of me. Or okay. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Nicholas, for being here. Uh, Nicholas will be here tomorrow night as well. Uh, there's another screening and another talk around 7.30, um, so please come over. Thank you. <coughs>